What I want to do today is I want to cover a bunch of issues that I have touched on, we have dealt with, but I want to make sure that you are 100% clear on them. So we're going to talk about three, well, there are the digitization. I gave you one lecture on that, but there is a whole other aspect of it that I want to cover. The question of inequality, which is, uh, uh, I hope that you're reading in the book the full section on inequality. I'm just going to touch on certain trends and on, on sort of very updated information. And then finally, ah, cities, well, cities is one general way of putting it. Thank you for that title. It's actually the buying up of cities, which doesn't sound as pretty as cities, you understand that. But what is happening around the world, again, this is something we talked, I talked about a while ago, and I just want to make sure this is emerging as a major issue. Now we have uh, Asian buyers, we have Middle Eastern buyers, and much of the buying happens, of course, outside of their countries. The leaders are still the Europeans and the Americans. Um, and it's not the buying up of a whole city, clearly, but it's the buying up of a lot of property. And that has created massive distortions. I think most of you are aware of this, right? Can I see who is absolutely not aware of this stuff that is happening, the buying of buildings? And New York is number one, huh? in terms of the amount of money that goes in here. Do you understand my question or not? No. no. I have already talked about it. Who said no? You have to talk with me after class, OK? Because you should. I've mentioned this. I've shown you slides. So it's the buying up of property. The property is often left unused. The idea of your average citizen is Poor investors, they got it wrong. They are losing money. Actually, no. They are financializing that building. They're using the materiality of the building to produce asset-backed securities. They are making far more money than if those, those uh, say, in an apartment building were rented out or were bought by buyers. They can continuously use those buildings to make asset-backed securities. This means that a big, it could be a luxury building, a new building, or an old building, but certainly a high, high price building that is standing there empty, is actually a very positive event for those who are using it to produce asset-backed securities. That is not good for cities, you understand that you have these empty buildings being a positive for investors. They should be a negative, because you want the buildings full of people or full of activity, et cetera, et cetera. Now, New York and London are the extreme cases, but this is something that is happening in more and more places, that you have a lot of either newly constructed buildings, sort of luxury towers, whatever, or, or older buildings that are under, that look underused, but they're actually being overused through other mediums. So I just would like for you to understand that this is an emergent trend, and it's only growing. So I have some of the most recent data that I want to share with you. Now, we'll start with the question of digitization. So I had, um, I'm just re repeating some of the stuff that I had covered in two or three slides and then going on to a whole other subject that involves the digital that I did not cover, okay? So first, this notion, I want you all just nail it down, that digitization should be seen as a variable. It can fulfill very diverse functions. So it can, one way, abstract way of putting it is, it can be completely derivative. You know, it might as well be a telephone or whatever, uh, or, uh, or, you know, it could be transformative. Or it can actually constitute whole new domains. And the slides of that first lecture where I develop all of this are, you know, on the, in, the, in, the, in the papers of the, of the class. So please do revisit that, especially if you weren't here when I talked about that. 
Now, the, the second critical element, which means that, you know, what I'm really doing here is positioning the digital in a, in a human setting where its consequences matter. They can be good or they can be bad. So it's not just the digital as a tool or as a, you know, as an application, etc. And so factoring in, you may recall that I, I talked quite a bit about this. How do you factor in? How do you bring in? How do you make visible the social logics that are also functioning in digital domains? Since a digital domain is mostly a technical condition, right? So one is the imbrications between IT and social context. Very poor neighborhoods may also have a digital link, but it's going to be quite different from a very rich university or from you know, a, you know, a totally different type of setup. So that is one, the imbrication meaning they're, they're separate elements, but they're sort of connected, they're working together. So remember the term imbrication. It is not that it's a third entity that is a mix of the two, no. Each maintains its specificity. The digital is absolutely distinct from whatever the social context. But when they work together, you can, find, you can think of them as a variable. It can be very positive for some, very negative for others. It can be indifferent. It can be a disaster for many or for the poor, whatever. You know, diff difficult, difficult, uh, different sort of outcomes. Now, the second point was the question of mediating cultures. That, again, it is, it is not unlike that first point on some level, but that who is using the technology? And I'm talking to a very large, large extent about interactive situations. Either the digital moment is interactive or it serves for an interaction, right? So people are involved, communities are involved, etc., etc. So access is not just shaped by your technical competence, it also is, or, or the interface design or whatever. There was a time when everybody was saying that that interaction is the interface design, that that provides it. Well, my God, that is just one little thingy in there, right? Uh, and so one language that you might think of is this notion of cultures of use. How is it getting used? For what purposes is it getting used? So, you know, low-income communities wind up being consumers of the tech and they buy consumer products linked like music or whatever and you know engineers do a completely different something like that now scaling right scaling you understand that right so many many different levels of scale certain entities when they intervene it becomes you know a national scale a global scale an international scale, whatever others it just happens within so the scaling bit is enormously variable and different actors and different tools and different you know tech features will make a difference um, now here i give this example on the scaling the powerful example in financial markets we see a new type of risk market risk a network effect various types of feedback we also see effects of expanding a program you know in a financial firm for instance among the powerless, it's a different set of conditions. So significant scaling can happen via recurrence. You don't go up, but you involve more and more situations, actors, communities that are at your level. So that is a kind of scaling. It's a horizontal scaling. You stay maybe in a poverty zone, but many different actors in that zone. Whereas in finance, often you're scaling up, up, up. So these are just, these are ways, if you want, of disassembling this, these sort of notions that these terms that we use, like the digital, the this, the that, you know, go crawling inside of it. And then you come up with a whole variety of differentiations. I want to talk about, and I would really like for you people to understand this, how, because we are far more familiar with high-tech uses of the tech then we are with very modest applications, with platforms that are getting developed to enable low-income neighborhoods. And it really is about sort of neighborhoods. 
And, and there is a whole new development that is very exciting right now here in New York about platforms. I don't know if people have followed that, but anyhow, um, that, that is also something that's happening, that's happening now. Apps that transform, this is what I want to focus on now, low-income communities into backup systems for the disadvantaged. Do you understand that sentence? In other words, it's not just a game a piece of music that you're buying basically, or oh, but you can buy it online or whatever, or listen. No, we're talking working applications that really make a difference in the lives of what are basically fairly low income uh, communities that have not been brought into the world, the tech world. When you look at some of the African countries where you had either nothing or you had the option of the digital, because that was sort of a leap that they did. Poor African community, I'm not saying all of them, but many, are far more enabled and far more advanced in their use of certain types of applications than you have in poor neighborhoods in New York. I mentioned to you already once, many people are still on dial-up. Many people don't even know, you know, so, so what? Yeah, I buy music with it, or I buy, you know. So, there is, this is very much in the United States and in other rich countries too, I would argue. The United States is pretty extreme here, I would say. A, a real division in terms of how this tech circulates. And I think I already mentioned in a past class that if you look at professionals and you look at scientists, lots of stuff, great stuff being developed. That you cannot say for the needs of low-income communities, low-income people, low-income workers at their workplaces and at their homes. Whereas we have it for the sort of the prosperous middle classes. That it makes a lot of difference in our lives. So this is a bit, so apps that transform low-income communities into backup systems for the disadvantaged. So I'm going to give you some examples here. So this is a project that I got involved in. This is a the Soros thing, but we call it open society. I think I mentioned this to you already. But anyhow, so I focused on two issues. And I have a very long, boring article that you can read. I think it might be on the, anyhow. So no, issue number one, how can digitization enhance the work life of low-income workers by addressing the specific needs of these workers at their workspace and in their neighborhoods? Because it's not enough to focus only on one or the other. It's that connection, because the low-wage worker has very, has enormous constraints, enormous controls hanging over them. If there is a home crisis, it's a crisis for them. There is no fluidity. So to me, this is a very important issue. So there should be, in my argument, there should be more innovation that meets the needs and constraints of low-wage workers. We have very little of that. They have been reduced to consumers, mostly, rather than, and this is beginning to change now, which is very exciting. Now, the key aspect, so I'm going to give you a few examples of some of these apps, you know, that are being made by doctoral students, by activists of this or that. They are not coming from, you know, the fancy firms. They're very much geared uh, towards, you know, towards enabling these sort of disadvantaged situations, if you want. So the key aspect that concerns me regarding low-wage workers is that this digital underutilization constructs a radical differentiation between workspace and life space. That is one item. And that's a killer. Most of us, like I, a professional woman, blah, blah, whatever, hey, it's totally fluid. You know, it's not, I close the door when I leave my home and then I have to leave it all alone and behind. And I close the door on my office. I'm never in my office, but you know what I mean, the, the workspace there. No, it sort of runs into each other, just to give a very simple example here. So now, this is disabling and adds to the difficulties in their life at work and off work. So a growing cultural distance with what is happening in low-income neighborhoods in this city. This is very much looking at New York City yeah, because it sort of varies a bit from one city to another, from one country to another, etc. <coughs> now, neighborhood is here used as a somewhat generic term. I use neighborhood rather than community because very often in low-income neighborhoods, you don't have much of a community. Very often, 
what happens is that the one that you have access to, to hate and hit, is your neighbor. And that is something that it does not fall from the sky like that ready-made, that is made by the absolute harshness of life. Now, it varies by culture, it varies, you know, there are, but I'm just mentioning this as an extreme example. So as a somewhat generic term to capture a fairly large local area with reasonable transport and generally modest socioeconomic standing of households. This is in New York City. There are places where there is no reasonable either. Huh? But just to, just to not look at the most desperate and the poorest, but to look at something, you know, they have access to transport, they have whatever, they can go to the shops. And yet, there is this sort of black hole, this absence of options. Now, that was issue number one. <laughs> Here is issue number two. And this is not, I'm not going to talk about this. This gets very complicated. But this is an issue. And it is an issue that is now finally beginning to receive attention. But for the longest time, it didn't. So an emergent complication that increasingly affects all workers. The use of semi-automated, you know, we're still in the era mostly of semi-automated, you understand, huh? not full automation. Semi. So there are people involved, and this is the issue here. So the use of semi-automated systems, which have seen particularly sharp innovation. I mean, the innovation curve has been like that in the world of work. There's also a cultural dimension here that I don't know that I'm going to get to. Now, such systems can generate, this is the key phrase here, ambiguity about responsibility when something goes wrong. You understand that, right? Insofar as the worker still has a role in their deployment, in the deployment of these technologies. So when something goes wrong, is it the fault of the robo robot or is it the fault of the worker? And here is what I want to get at. So in the case of factory and delivery workers, and we have evidence on this, huh? this is not sort of an, 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 an inference. We have in the case of factory and delivery workers, the increase in the use of robotic tools and machines can be devastating if something goes wrong, since they probably don't have access to the specialized lawyering uh, if the employer does not pay for it. And, is, and this is, in fact, most cases what happens. And so they, they, you know, they wind up simply being accused. They get it wrong. Now, the high-end workers, we're talking very high-end workers, they have access to extraordinarily specialized lawyering, because that's what it takes. And they can go to court with a lawyer who has a lot of the knowledge and says, look, this is what exactly happened here between you know, the machine and the human. So this is a division that is just only growing uh, you know, by the day, so to say. Um, now, one helpful source for in-depth discussion of this ambiguity about responsibility, the machine or tool versus the worker using it, can be found in a series of lawsuits. So I've been looking at these lawsuits. And it is really quite interesting. And the workspace of the high level is quite different from the workspace of the low-level workers. And so that means that the lawyering that is happening that is focused on these specialized issues is mostly looking, of course, at the high end because they are the people, the clients have the money to pay. And this becomes a world where de facto anything goes wrong, worker is guilty. Except if there is overwhelming evidence, a machine exploded, you know, something like that. So, so this is, and the other issue, third issue, you, we all have heard the robot that thought that something there was rubbish and killed it, because this is a robot that was meant to clean up. <laughs> and there was a worker in the wrong place, and the robot destroyed that worker, thinking it was rubbish. You know, that, that is the other part of it, right? That in certain work situations, there are risks, and the systems are not always functioning exactly as they should. So, uh, you, now, this, this part, I'm not, you can forget about all of this. I mean, it's information, you should be aware of it. But this is just so that you get a sense, you know, of the spread of issues. Now, here are a few, just very simple apps, which I think, 
sort of give you a sense of what can be done. You know, any of you could develop some of these apps. I mean, we're not talking. So this is a simple app for teachers. And here is the notion. Just read this quickly. Here is a notion. So low-income neighborhood, uh, children who maybe don't go to the best school, are troubled by the school. They often don't really go to the school, maybe. Some days, they disappear and do stuff. You know, we have evidence on all of this. We, we know what we're talking about. Um, if the teacher goes through the system, the system says, aha, uh -huh, uh, delinquent student, basically. How do you avoid that? Because that is something that actually, when you talk with people in low-income neighborhoods, in, in schools, whether kill, children go to schools that aren't very good, this is a big issue. This is something that hurts deeply. It happens regularly, and the pain stays there. You know, for I mean, it's, it doesn't just go away easily. And so here is a simple app that allows the teacher to connect without speaking, just you know, a little information bit. Your kid is not at school. Thereby, the teacher can alert the parent, and the parent then is on notice, and you avoid the system whereby that child might be expelled or the parent be seen as irresponsible, etc., etc. Now, we are talking low-income neighborhoods, low-income people, difficult situations, etc., etc. Um, okay, so this, yeah, you read that, right? So she knows. OK, I will be alerted. You know, and that makes a lot of difference for people. Now, here is another one. A lot of these were developed by, by doctoral students or by you know, people. And some of them then, then are, are also sort of very modest organizations. You know? But the fact is that some of these could be used by millions of households. Now, so, it, so this, this, is a, this is an app that simplifies applying for government services. I don't need to develop more, right? So that is, can be a nightmare, especially if you are not you know, highly educated or you, you are from a foreign country, et cetera, et cetera. So neat streak. Let home cleaners communicate with cl clients in a quick, non-obstructive way. The main advantage goes to both parties. And one issue here is preventing a catastrophe that might wind up with a cleaner going to jail, even if she's innocent. You can move in quickly, you say, okay, something is not working here, you alert your employer. You understand? So these are all little rescue operations, if you want. Now, a money management app for mobiles, which combines cash and loan requests, simplifying the lives of very low-income people who need to cash their paychecks before payday. And you know that the payday Operations are really they're like little vultures. Huh? So you can avoid that with that app. Um, well, it goes on and on. Huh? But uh, let's see, what do I have here? Health professionals with a crown. Huh? OK, blah, blah, you read it. Yes, read it, read it, read it. And I just want to move. So here are apps to develop new ways of working together online. This is very common among people like ourselves. It could add a lot to low-income neighborhoods and low-income workers, et cetera, et cetera. It can enable a sense of an individual's worth to a network, and thereby foster solidarity. And so you know, I'm talking about elements that begin to grow, that begin to grow, and that begin to build platforms for them, you know, I mean, in their minds and both operational, et cetera. There is one, uh, I think I may have mentioned it in a past class, there is one, um, one app that I find extraordinarily actually useful and imaginative, because it also gets ultimately at the notion of how do we build trust and sort of solidarity. I'm not saying love or anything like that, not within a neighborhood, within a low income, you know, stressed out neighborhood. And that's the emergency nanny. I see that I haven't listed here. So the emergency nanny is a set of people who are stable in the neighborhood, who you, who, a resident, a worker, etc. Create as your little group. So you are at your workplace, and in our poor neighborhoods, you are at your workplace. You don't have much of a chance to pick up a phone and start talking if you have a problem. Let's say your aunt or your whatever is 
didn't manage to get to your house to take care of the kids. You get it, right? And so you have a crisis. And in our low work places, most of them, you don't get to sort of, oh, we start making 15 calls, see if you can find anybody. So the, the emergency nanny is a little app. You just click on the app. Now you will have every individual, so to say, you will have formed your group of people who will be mobilized. It will be the emergency nanny, four or five people who are static in the neighborhood, whatever. And, um, you know, and so they are then alerted. You have delegated to them. You keep on working. You don't lose your job. You don't get into trouble with the boss. In the meantime, you know that four or five people whom you really trust are taking care of things. They organize among themselves. For me, there is an added element, which is that you begin to create collective endeavors. You see what I'm saying? So that's quite good. Now, I like to mention, you know, that, that um, well, it's, there's no time. I'm just going to. Now, we, so in, in apps that can strengthen the collective space of the disadvantaged, that is one frame, that is one way of thinking about it. We matter to each other. And eventually, you know, the aspiration is, of course, that you're open sourcing the neighborhood. You know that stuff is happening. People are communicating. People are developing certain types of skills, et cetera, et cetera. OK, so here, you know, the larger ecologies of meaning, which in a city really grow, really become significant. So the specific technical capabilities of interactive te technologies, here it's a bit more abstract, OK, deliver their utilities through complex ecologies. The disadvantage that low-income neighborhoods have had is that whatever complexity might be there, it sort of disappeared. It's not experienced, it's not noticed, and it doesn't grow. So some of these apps also have the effect of creating little levels, novel arrangements, novel contacts, etc., and therewith begin to raise the level of complexity that is operational in that neighborhood and among those people. So, uh, you have, you know, the fact that the logics of users can diverge significantly from the engineer's logic. This, to me, is a major issue. This is where I started getting engaged by this, like, 30 years ago. And that is that one thing is the engineer who developed. The other one is the user. Now, we've gotten very, very good at meeting the user's needs when these users are middle class or rich. We are not as good, you know, with low-income people. So... And then one way, quickly, sort of, of framing it is that when you put it all together, these little interactions, these little, you know, you're, you're beginning to build platforms. And so in the city, this should mean maximizing a kind of open source urbanism. And that is where the technology is very good. It allows the open sourcing and thereby also enables that urbanism. So this is a way of looking at the tech from the perspective of the needs of fairly disadvantaged people. And that is something that, you know, is not happening enough because everybody just wants to work on the fanciest and latest and I don't know what. Now, this is the second subject, inequality. And we have already talked about inequality in the class, but I just want to talk about inequality and its many formats. In other words, inequality is not just simply inequality of income. Okay, there are many different ways in which inequality is actually embedded in all kinds of situations. So now, first I want to show you some curves. All right? You're, I'm assuming that you're all familiar with that. So this is, here, look, at, look at the title. Average corporate profits after tax in the US. We're going to stick with the US because it varies so much from one country to another. The US is very extreme and hence a very good case, if you want, because it clarifies. And this is 1948 to 2016. Now, here are the earlier years. You know, it's sort of, you can see that there is a kind of stability. Then it begins to grow. This is when we basically privatize, deregulate, and globalize. And then these corporate profits begin to grow. And there you really have a big, by then we have uh, cut off, you know, thank you to uh, some presidents, etc., cut off the protection, 
the division between banks and financial sector. Do you know what I'm talking about or not? That was a very significant. Clinton deregulated the financial sector. So the financial sector could move into all the areas that once were the domain of banks, uh, credit associations, etc., that operated on a very modest scale, just interest payments. Finance doesn't operate on interest payments. Finance operates on a totally different logic and is not modest, you know, to put it, to put it simply. Now, look at this. Look at that curve. That, you know, here we are in full-fledged new mode, nothing to do with Keynesianism. This is Keynesianism. This is finance at work, and the traditional banks have basically been killed. The, the, whatever the savings associations, out, out, out. Now, this, we were just talking about average corporate profits, okay, after tax. And then, now this, here, that, that is the crisis, right? Remember the crisis? 208, et cetera, huh? That crisis, which still lasts for many workers today, lasted about two days, I exaggerate, in this sector. And then, after that, oh, well, yeah, after that, the curve goes even further up, and all kinds of things were changed for that to happen. More deregulation, more support. I already mentioned to you people, the, the Federal Reserve Bank transferred $7 trillion of money to all the major financial firms in the world, including Germans, including blah, 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 seven trillion. Add to that quantitative easing, another seven trillion, that's what it amounts to, 14 trillion were transferred to the financial sector, basically. In Congress, that is where you and I have standing, the discussion was, Shall we transfer to the global banking system, or to the banking system, whatever they call the banking system, uh, 300 uh, million? Very different figure. The decision was, yes, we will. I mean billions, I'm sorry, billions. Uh, and they transferred, that was the famous discussion in the, in the, in the legislature, etc., which was really a good discussion. B uh, Bloomberg News, suspected, as did several of us who were working on this, suspected what was happening in the Fed, this transfer of money secretly. Um, freedom of information was submitted by Bloomberg News, not a radical outfit, uh, to the Fed. What's happening? What is the Fed doing with the banking system, transferring money? Uh, it took the Fed two years and a half to respond. It is absolutely unacceptable. They were hiding it. The Financial Times, I mentioned this already to you, but I mentioned it again because I want it really engraved. The Financial Times published, when all the data came out, published a front page story with all the details, listing, for instance, 21,000 requests for that cheap money from our Fed, that's our money, uh, by entities foreign and national. Almost nobody really saw that front page because by then the discussion had happened two years and a half earlier. And it had, of course, been focused on what was happening in the legislature, which is a moment of public debate. I mean, this is such a level of corruption that is just extraordinary. But you know, it, you cannot say that it is illegal. You don't need to understand the details, but the way I described it to you, you understand the logic, I hope, right? So that you have a sense of the types of transactions that were happening. And that explains, to some extent, that after that, they did even better. Even if a lot of the workers were not doing better, a lot of the middle class people were not doing better. So this is, a, this is serious stuff. And here is corporate business, financial, the same thing. You know, they barely registered the crises. Now, this is an aggregate figure. You know, there might have been some banks or some corporates that did feel the crisis and others not. 
Now, this is something that the United States is an extreme instance, but this is happening also in Germany. It's happening, you know, in countries that we respect for having played it sort of according to the rules. But it's really, it's becoming a mode. The instruments are, you know, it's algorithmic mass, beautiful instruments in terms of the, what it takes to construct them. So it, it gives you a sense of this is all positive, this is advanced, this is more complex knowledge, et cetera, et cetera. In the meantime, you know, it is not a pretty story. Now I have to move on. Also here, I just wanted to, so central government debt in select countries. So the United States here, 40 billion or something, and now 97. That is a, that is a big, uh, that is a big growth rate. You don't need to, this is too complicated really, and there are too many little thingies in there, but just so you get a sense of what I'm talking about. Um, now, this is tax evasion, another darling subject. The main, the United States, so this, just to give you a sense, <laughs> so there's this, you know, this is the size of the shadow economy which is small in the, you know, in the U.S., if you want, uh, compared to, say, Russia. Huh? However, this is tax loss in billions. And there the United States ranks rather high. So there is a kind of drainage of resources that gradually has affected, in fact, the middle classes. It has affected student debt. It has affected a lot of things. The stuff, the negatives that we are experiencing do not fall from the sky ready-made. They are made. And these are some of the, if you want, instrumentalities to which it happens. Now, okay, this is sort of, you can even understand that. I'm just going to move on here. Okay, and this is, of course, you all, you're all familiar with this. It's also in the book, etc. So, you know, there, there is a truly a very acute, not acute, eh, acute, reshaping of distributional issues. I mean, you have to understand this. You know, you don't need to know everything about it, but the fact that this is happening. Um, now, this is something else that it's just an important datum. You know, it's a different subject. Male, involuntary part-time workers, ages in Greece, Italy, Portugal, Spain, and the United States. And so you can see these curves, they all show growth, some worse than others. Huh? Um, so it's about male involuntary part-time workers. You understand? Instead of having full-time jobs, they have part-time jobs. So this is a sort of a negative again. Though some of those workers are going to be very happy, at least they had a job, all right? That, that, that is part of the story too. Um, what I wanted to capture here in this graph is that Spain, which is a country that number one had a crisis, number two had had a lot of immigrants come to Spain because it was a very well working economy in many ways, at some point hits the crisis and what you have is a lot of out migration happening, uh, including of course of Spaniards. Now here I want to get at this bit of the buying of pieces of the city. I have already talked to you about this but I really want you to understand what is happening. So just read, okay? I'll read with you, but 2014 to 2015 is the data that we're going to work with. That is the, the latest data that is full. There is already data for 2015 to 2016, but it is not as complete as this. So the global property investment market powered further. Oh, by the way, this is text that I copied from a business report. I don't talk this language, okay? You can see that first sentence, that's not my language. The property market powered further ahead over year to June with volumes, I mean, no. So anyhow, but there it is. Huh? So from 15, enormous, top 25 investment targets. Look at that language, targets. So capital rise, 25 versus a 10-8 rise for the rest of the market. In other words, the top 25 markets, the markets are cities, by the way. And they are described as markets. I mean, they are markets in many ways, but the point here is the, the, the value of property, etc. So the top 25 
are doing extraordinarily well, and the rest is also doing well. It's all growing, but it's interesting the extent to which there is concentration on these top 25. Now, I'm going to show you. Here is a, a sense of a distribution. Now, <coughs> this is the latest data we have. This is not my data, by the way. So top 25 cities for investment. And you can see at the top, New York, of course, number one. London number two. I mean, it's quite something. Now, if you look at the full distribution, you know, you get to go through quite a mix of cities. I also must say, just as a footnote, I love this, this look. You know, everything is mixed here. The cities, you have Shanghai, Amsterdam, and Austin, you know, all sitting together as if they had some connections. Uh, they might have some, but so, you know, this is just a list of the value that is being uh, uh, deployed to buy property. This is not new development. As you see, it excludes actual building. It's just buying, buying what is there. And New York is number one. Now, New York, out, New York, which has a housing crisis, you know, for about 50% of its people, in fact, more than 50%. But anyhow, it's number one. It, she's the queen of the domain. New York outgrew all these top markets. <laughs> I find this language amazing. You know, when you're my age, you will also be smiling at this. I can see that you are too earnest about this. Anyhow, New York outgrew all these top markets, increasing its global market share 7.7% to 7.9%. That's very little growth. But in terms of the actual how those markets function, that is quite a bit. It just looks a bit, you know. So U.S. cities overall had the best of the growth. With my, this is, again, not my language. Okay, I just copied this. With Miami and Atlanta particular winners, with volumes rising 75% and 61%. Now, you understand that what we are talking about is that there are buyers of buildings. That is what we're talking about. We're not talking jobs. We're not talking distribution of earnings. No, we're talking the buying of buildings by foreigners and by nationals. So the, descript the language is that, oh my god, look at you know Miami and Atlanta rising 75% and 61%. You understand that for the city, that is not necessarily good. I don't know if that, maybe I should have clarified that. One has to go check it out. Especially, remember where I started, that some of those buildings might be empty and they're just simply being used to produce asset-backed securities. So they, being empty is great. That's a very weird little thingy in there. Now, elsewhere in the top 10, London's market share stood at five. Huh? Okay, we can skip this. Note, note, note. While U.S. markets dominated the very top of the city leader board, among all larger markets, those generating some of the biggest rises were in two emerging Asian markets, and those are the only two that are in this top tier, Mumbai and Nanjing. Mumbai, we can sort of think, Nanjing is sort of interesting, because they have done uh, uh, the major cities. They've done Beijing, they've done Shanghai, they've done Shenzhen. So now Nanjing, I've noticed it in other, other studies as well. Nanjing is, has the highest sort of growth rate. That doesn't mean the highest absolute level of buying of property. Again, I want to remind you that. So these were the only emerging markets in the top 50 fastest growing investment cities. The remainder include a number of smaller cities, such as Norfolk, Oklahoma City, Louisville, etc. This is actually rather disturbing. The numbers might be low, but it means that this machinery of buying property to use it to make asset-backed securities or to use it to sell, you know, there might be a whole range of uses here, is actually expanding to smaller and smaller cities. The effect of that, the immediate effect, you understand what it is, right? It raises the price of housing for, and the ones that, that, that are affected are, of course, the modest middle classes, the modest working classes. This takes away property and space and situates it in a global circuit. I mean, it stays there, but that means that parts of the city, like what happened with Manhattan, that Manhattan, more and more of the modest middle classes who used to live in Manhattan, can't live in Manhattan anymore. Not the firemen, not the nurses. And there was a time when they, they could live in Manhattan. And so you're taking away space and situating it in another circuit. And that's not so good for cities, you know? Um, now, look, how they, look at the language. 
New York, San Francisco, and Chicago are among the top 50 fastest growing. This is new language, city markets. This is not urban markets as markets in a city. This is the city as market. Now, what I find striking, and this is a whole new data set that has sort of come out, you know, very recently, it's that, that you know, these smaller cities are also uh, entering that other circuit. So here they are. They're all buildings. They're materialities. They are there in Norfolk or in Louisville. But they're also situated in a global investment circuit. That is what is happening. And that second part is invisible to the average resident. They don't know that that's happening. They just see there's the building. But that building, and that is then creates an extraordinarily rapid rise in pricing. It reduces the modest supply of housing for the middle classes and the working. So you know you have a whole, these problems that one experiences in New York or in London, they're very familiar. They don't fall from the sky. They are made, you know, and, like, and let's remember something again that I ask you to really sort of not forget, the fact that in the 1970s and into the early 1980s, most of our cities were poor. The action was not in these cities. The action was, you know, building the suburbs, which varied, you know, from country to country, clearly, and sort of the you know, the vast infrastructural projects at the national level, etc. And as I've said several times already, New York, London, Paris, they were all broke. And then comes, and all the experts were saying, the cities are finished. The action is no longer in cities. And then this new, as I described it to you, operational space installs itself, so to speak, in these cities and generates a whole new, uh, sort of a set of whole new economies for which the buildings, the materialities involved are situated in a completely different circuit. It's not the house. It's a material asset rather than a fictive, you know, a derivative based on another derivative. So you don't need to know the financial details, but what you need to know is that what lies there in stone in front of you that you can see with your eyes is actually potentially, depending where you are and what it is, operating in a whole other circuit as well. And this, I'm convinced, is not good for cities. This is very bad because it, it basically means the financializing of buildings. Um, now, this is more of all that detail. I don't want to go into that. Here's yet another car. You can see it's everything at the top, the top, the top. Extraordinarily mixture of cities and different countries. These are sort of the images that I want you to have, that there is this mix, you know? Um, and here, a lot more stuff. Now, look at the language. I find this language is, has its own way of codifying. Uh, so, the fastest growing stream of international investment last year was from Europe. We're talking investment in buying property, okay? That is what you're talking about. So you actually, they don't even say they're buying up buildings in, in a city. No, it's an investment stream. You know, that really makes an abstract language. Oh, that sounds so good, investment stream. God, I like it, I want one. So that, that's also troublesome. You lose the language that captures the actual city, a city being this complex zone with many different people. No, investment stream, that is what it is now. So followed by the Americas at 26, and then the Middle Eastern investment rose, that's a rapidly growing Middle Eastern, they're buying also all over. I already mentioned the Qataris, right? The Qatari royals who own more of central London than the Queen of England. I love saying that every time. Um, and stuff like that, but, but here one really issue, if you begin to read in the data, any of you who is interested in that, be on guard about the language because the language has its own, you know, it creates a conceptual zone that is quite, you know, something. Now, part of this pattern, etc., reflects changes. You know, there's always life in all of this. Huh? There's things that are changing, some rise, others fall, etc. Now here, 
This is an interesting one. So this is, as you can see, sources of international capital. So where's the money coming from? Huh? So in the Americas, so here you have these, the years, you know, uh, you, uh, and where is this other thing here? Yeah. So these are different years, different modes, and they, so you can see that they tend to recur. Huh? This, is a, this is a whole productive process, if you, or production process, that different countries have different levels, but you know, they all are experienced, not all the countries, but the regions. Huh? The critical parts of each region is experiencing a similar type of investment. Different levels, but still, it's there. Huh? That, that is the thing, that this is truly a global, multi-sided, it installs itself, not everywhere in the world, but in many different regions of the world. And it is a systematicity. It shares features. The money may be coming from Qatar, it may be coming from New York, it may be coming from Russia, but once it enters these circuits, it shares, they share features. And that is why, you know, these data are actually quite interesting because they tell you something about a standardizing Another standardizing is one way of putting it. The other way to putting it is these are global circuits. And so, yeah, why don't, why shouldn't we go to Oklahoma also? And what comes after that? I mean, you know, that's a bit the. Uh, now, here is again the money backs, if you want. Huh? The top five global investors have been the USA, followed by Singapore. That's a surprising datum, actually. So Singapore is rich and extremely well organized, but that they would be number two. Anyhow, Canada, China, and Norway. That's a quite an interesting mix of countries. You know, they, Norway has the best run sovereign fund, unlike any other. In other words, they know that the oil, that the wealth that they have now is not going to last, so they're making provisions for whatever the money they make now, for spending it in 20 or 30 years when that money will not exist. I mean, this is amazing. This is the only, and there they are. <laughs> you know, it's just quite, uh, I don't know if you're still with me, actually. I'm having a ball looking at all of this, but I'm not sure. All I want you is to understand these trends, you know, that are invisible to the eye, that a city looks like a city, and there is a, another operational level that is also being shaped. Um, now, what do we have here? Regional versus global investment, okay? So you can see the difference. So the dark blue is money that is coming from outside the home region, and this is within the region. So you can see Asia Pacific, mostly from outside. North America, mostly from outside. Europe, mostly from inside. Now, Europe has a lot of countries. So the Germans are buying up a lot of Paris. That's this. <laughs> you know. So anyhow, it's within Europe. Uh, this is almost all outside the home region. And then Latin America. Latin America is very slowly beginning to be a player in all of this. It would be better for it not to be, but um, this is how it is. It's really a spreading thing. Now here are the buyer types, and this is just a quick, just to get a sense of, you know, the high net worth individual, sovereign wealth, pension funds, insurance companies, equity funds, and then the REITs, you know, which are real estate instruments. So, you know, you have a whole variety. In other words, they're buying up cities, pieces, of, not cities, but pieces of cities. It's a big business, and you have a diversity of actors, not just not just these guys that were in real estate, etc. No, 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 a whole variety. And you have a whole variety of countries that are buying in other countries. Now, this, I think this is the last one. Yeah. So, so where this goes next, I don't know. But what is happening right now, which has been happening for five years or so at, at this sort of acute scale, it is making a profound transformation that is, number one, invisible to the eye, mostly, and that is very partial. This is very important to understand. 
It's very partial. Most of Manhattan is still poor. So, so, you know, it's elements. But with complex uh, uh, models, all those little elements have been put on one plane. And so they can buy, sell, buy, sell, buy, sell across the world just very quickly. It's a whole invisible operational space where a lot of urban stuff is getting bought and sold. And what's after this, I don't know, but I just think it's very important for, since we're talking global urbanism in this class, for you to be aware of this. So try to, um, I might just ask you a question, okay, about all of this. You don't need to have the little details, but the concept, the conceptual version, okay? So I'll see you Monday.